Welcome back. This is World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The area within the nine dashed line was first demarcated by China. It is a maritime boundary formed after China's long term jurisdiction and development of the South China Sea. That is believed by the Chinese side. But in recent years, the United States and other countries have intervened in the South China Sea by making false remarks and taking provocative military actions. Many experts and scholars think both sides need political wisdom to solve the problem. Earlier, I talked to one of the best respected experts, David Lampton, professor and director of China studies at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He shared his views on China-U.S. relations regarding the South China Sea and the long-term strategic ties. You talk about war. Therefore, I have to go to one area with you. Earlier this year, you co-wrote a paper with Professor Wang Jisi talking about the danger of the South China Sea being used by some as a playground, quote-unquote, or a battleground for perpetual danger between China and the United States and also for the Southeast Asian nations, um, a conflict zone, in your words. Professor, how far are we from there? Well, by its very nature, both sides now have a lot of equipment, by which I mean planes, uh, ships, missiles, uh, in, in the region moving relatively close to each other. So one of the worries is simply that an accident uh, or some miscalculation by local military officials of either China or the United States or both miscalculate or make a mistake. So that's one whole aspect. Um, and I want to make clear on the South China Sea, I think both countries uh, are at fault, but I must confess that if China could reach an accommodation and a reassuring policy with China's neighbors, uh, that the U.S. would stand back and I think let an arrangement get worked out by the parties there. Uh, so I, I want to make it clear the U.S. has, I think, adopted a more clear and forceful policy recently, but this does not forego the opportunity for the uh, Chinese and it might be the Malaysians or the Indonesians or uh, the Vietnamese to arrive at their own satisfactory settlement. And I think, I don't speak for our government, uh, but I do think uh, we would be very happy to see you all resolve this peacefully among yourselves. But Professor Lampton, from this part of the world, the biggest worry is that some in the administration with a long time Cold War mentality trying to make use of this issue and to achieve what they have in mind as their long term political goal, which is to damage China United States relations to an extent that there is no return. If I could read some of the latest things I got on hand, the U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo earlier tweeted that the South China Sea is now China's maritime empire. In response, Wang Wenbin, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson, said on Tuesday this, according to media reports, in the first half of this year, U.S. military aircraft carried out over 2,000 missions in the South China Sea. Since July the 15th, U.S. military aircraft have conducted close-range reconnaissance in the South China Sea for 12 consecutive days. Uh, and he said we must uh, tell Pompeo that the South China Sea is not Hawaii. Of course, there are a lot of rhetorics going on between the two uh, foreign policy uh, body of the government, but the real issue is how much danger, Professor, we are facing right now of a quote-unquote military accident which could spiral out of control? Well, I think it's a substantial danger. And given that we're two nuclear powers and the world's two biggest economies, even a small, the pro a small probability 
of a very damaging event is intolerable. So I would say the odds are not great, but the more numbers, like you pointed to, uh, even a small probability of accident means there's a considerable chance over a period of time that something will happen. Yeah. So I would say I'm very worried about that. Uh, I would say also uh, in both our societies now, there's a dangerous, um, I would say somewhere between military attitude and nationalism mm -hmm. in both of our countries. And what we need now is leaders who will educate their citizens rather than fan their extremism. Professor, we had the collision years ago between China and the United States uh, near the uh, Hainan Island. That, of course, was under a very different uh, uh, geopolitical and strategic context and eventually being resolved. Is there any chance that we can learn from the earlier cases how small scale accident eventually became a bilateral issue but eventually after that being resolved? Under the current circumstances, is there still any chance that we could learn? Well, I think you're raising what we call the EP3 incident yes, indeed. in 2001 One. in uh, April. And uh, that, that is a, a, I'll call it a crisis or a big incident between the United States and China that has many valuable lessons. Uh, I think the f first lesson I would draw is uh, at that time, America had an ambassador in Beijing who had happened to be head of the Pacific Command of the U.S. Navy, and he was then ambassador. And so when this unfortunate incident occurred, he was able to directly contact people he knew in other circumstances. And I don't want to say there was perfect trust, but there was a basic foundation of people knowing each other and having dealt with each other in other circumstances. So I think that shows the importance of personal exchanges. It shows the importance of military to military ties. Uh, and uh, I, this is one of the things I worry about the current circumstance is that fr quite frankly, our military to military ties are not in good shape at all which is my way of saying in terrible shape. So I think we need to restore our military to military ties, not because talking will make all the problems go away, but, but interpersonal knowledge is important and a feel for the problems that each side has, the other capital has, are important. So I would say uh, channels of communication. Secondly, uh, when that uh, crisis in 2001 went out of, let us say, uh, got a little out of hand. Uh, one of the reasons was is people on both sides started talking publicly and blaming the other. And once you publicly blame the other side, it's very hard for you to back off and say, well, maybe, maybe it, it, there was some more to this story. My basic point is we have too many people talking too loud in public and not enough people talking together quietly. One of the things people I've been talking to from the Chinese side at least is the lack of communication channels that even, even if you want to talk quietly, there's no way of reaching your counterpart. There's no way of finding an appropriate person from an appropriate angle to talk about issues and discuss issues. That is right. the problem we are facing right now. And further than that... Well, let me assure you, Chen Wei, it's please. not you only that has the problem. Mm. There are many Americans that can't find the right person to talk to now either. So uh, that's a problem. Uh, the current administration still has not uh, filled with permanent officials, I, th I think about one third or a quarter of our State Department yes. personnel. So that's one problem. 
Secondly, China has become a political football here in electoral politics. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, people that don't want to talk about other issues would prefer to talk about China. Uh, but we have to get people that try to insulate domestic politics from foreign policy. It can never be perfect. It, it, it's very hard to do, whether you're an electoral system like ours or a system such as yours. Mm. There's always domestic politics. But I think the recent period is notable for the degree to which political leaders are using dissatisfaction with the other country to bolster their own domestic circumstance. It's hard now till the election. China become a football. You said it very clear. Everybody understands that. China understands that too. Here in China, if you ask people, even on the street, whether China has become an election football in the United States, they would say yes, they understand that. However, even understanding that reality, how to control the risk is another issue from now till election, from the election till inauguration, and probably even a bit after the inauguration, before the new administration figure out what they want to do. So almost a one year's time, huge danger, never precedented in China-U.S. relations in this uh, sense. Professor Lampton, with your rich knowledge about these two countries, what are some of your advices? Well, first of all, I think as long as people, uh, politic politicians see that um, sort of utilizing another country, in this case China or Chinese using America for their own domestic purposes, but in the case of the United States, I think if poli the politicians, in this case President Trump, sees there's no public support for that, then they will turn to something else that they see more effective. So I think the first thing we need to do, and that by we, I mean people who spend more time looking at Asia and China, uh, people who have long-term national interests in mind, need to do a better job of educating our people. And frankly, I would say that about the uh, public intellectuals in China as well. We have an obligation to speak truth to power and, uh, and uh, moderate it the best we can, a le uh, leadership behavior. And more to the point, we have to show politicians that uh, uh, nationalism isn't their trump card. Uh, secondly, I think we need to, uh, and this is maybe the more important point, recognize that there are things that we can positively do if there is a new political circumstance starting in 2021. And I think there's a good chance. So we ought to be engaging in dialogues at all levels. You ought to, your governor should be dealing with our governors. Um, NGOs should be dealing with NGOs or what are the things that when we get a different circumstance, which I believe we will, I'm not certain, and I was wrong on the last election, but I think uh, now we need to build an agenda of how will we improve things if the political circumstance permits. And so I think we ought to be thinking about that. How can we work to on a bilateral investment treaty? How can we both join TPP? Uh, how can we have a phase two economic agreement? Uh, how can we reach a understanding on short and medium range ballistic missiles? In other words, we should be developing a rich agenda so that when we have a new opportunity, we seize it. So that's not certainty. The U.S. may not behave as I, in electoral terms as I think is very likely. But we ought to be planning for a better day. And it, it, it's not going to change overnight. The Republicans and the Democrats agree about a lot of things. But I think we will restore a reasonable, rational foreign policy. 
and both sides should be ready to seize the opportunities. Mm. Some suggest in front of a historic building that engaging with China has failed over the past decades. As someone who witnessed that policy from the very start until today, Professor, do you agree? No, and uh, I'm working with a colleague on a, a book uh, essentially on that topic. Uh, what did we learn from engagement and did it fail is the general topic. And I think the answer to that is clearly not. Mm. Now, it didn't prevent our current problems, but let's just put it this way. In the Cold War, over 100,000 Americans died in conflicts involving China. A large number of Chinese people died in those same conflicts. That didn't happen for the next 40 years. China was poorer than Cambodia at the start of reform and now is the world's second biggest economy. And American incomes have continued to go up. So we've got to address some problems, but I think whether you look at it in economic terms or security terms, mm -hmm. the last 40 years were by the standards of foreign policy, I think among the world's uh, great successes. The problem isn't that the past failed. The problem is how can we learn from the mistakes of the past and, and continue a record of both peace and prosperity. Professor David Lumpton, as always, what a pleasure, sir. Thank you for Good the historic you. perspective and also thank you for enlightening us of a plan for the future. Really appreciate it, sir. Well, you have a good evening and uh, best to you and your people.